Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. An overnight fire under investigation this morning after investigators find someone dead inside that home. What investigators think happened? Plus, what's the latest on the pilot who was just seconds away from being hit by a train? David Sears has an update ahead in your morning headlines. Today, local students are showing off their skills raising animals and different agricultural projects. Coming up, we take you to the Atascosa County Livestock Show, where students will be competing for prizes and money. Good morning, I'm Max Mass, and we are here at Burger Teca talking about Culinario Restaurant Week, what it means to the community, and what it means for local businesses. We're going to explain in just a bit. And good morning to you. It's Tuesday. It's January 11th. Thanks for joining us this morning. Still kind of cold in the 40s, but uh, I guess we're, at least we're not in freezing temperatures. Right. And uh, for the large part, in large part, Justin Horn joins us now. So we we'll go outside with live cam. We've got some activity on radar, but tell us what's really happening out there, Justin. Well, it's just very, very light stuff. We kind of talked about this yesterday. If we did get some rain, some of it wouldn't reach the ground. If we did see it, it would be very light, maybe some sprinkles. And that's uh, really what's materializing this morning. Let's first start with the radar and you can see this light activity that looks fairly widespread. It's working through the hill country. I have no doubt that there probably is some rain reaching the ground. It's just not going to add up to much. If you're along I-10, Kerrville to Junction, you're likely going to see a few light showers here within the next hour or so. Interestingly enough, we did see a tweet earlier. It looks like there was a little bit of grapple in Del Rio. That's some frozen precipitation, even though the surface temperatures are right around 50. That's just high level moisture. Just cold enough for some of that to reach the ground, but you don't need to worry about wintry weather. That's really not in the cards. What we saw was very, very light. Uh, we'll zoom in a little bit closer here to around the Kerrville area, and you can see some of that rain trying to work towards I-10. It looks much worse than it is. Again, this is all going to be very, very light. Temperature-wise, 45 degrees at the airport, 41 Boulevard, 40 in Las Maples, 50 out in Del Rio, 47 in Pleasanton. And here's what to expect today. We'll see mostly cloudy skies, a few sprinkles here in San Antonio. Warmer, more sun next several days. And by the weekend, we got another cold front. It'll be windy, turning cooler yet again. Today, 55 degrees and just a small chance again of a few sprinkles or a light shower, guys. Thank you, Justin. And look out there with Transguide uh, situation there, I-35 at Ritterman. I do believe we have Stephen Cavazos on the way to the scene, and we're going to try to check with him once he gets there. We'll keep tabs on that for you and look for updates coming up right now. Here's today's 9 at 9. President Biden is renewing his push for new voting rights measures during his visit to Atlanta today. The president is pushing to protect the constitutional right to vote and to safeguard election integrity. The speech will come as he braces for a bruising fight over voting rights legislation that has stalled in the Senate. Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Rochelle Walensky and others will testify before a U.S. Senate committee today. The group will be questioned about the federal response to COVID-19 variants. The U.S. is now averaging more than 700,000 new coronavirus cases per day. The CDC might start recommending people wear N95 or KN95 masks as opposed to other types. Washington Post cites an unnamed official who says the agency is considering the change. The CDC says the Omicron variant spread so easily that normal face coverings may not do the job. Health insurance companies will soon have to cover over-the-counter COVID-19 tests. Insurers will be required to pay for eight tests a month per person. A doctor's order, prescription, or office visit will not be required. The test also won't be subject to co-pays or deductibles. The new coverage requirement starts Saturday. The American Red Cross says blood donations are urgently needed right now. The Red Cross says blood supply is at a dangerously low level across the country. Surging COVID-19 cases, severe weather, declines in donor turnout, canceled blood drive and staffing issues are all contributing to the shortage. Officials say beloved actress Betty White died of a stroke. The complications happened six days before she passed away on New Year's Eve. She was 99. Her 100th birthday is on Monday of next week. Flight cancellations are slowing down as airlines dig themselves out of delays caused by bad weather and staffing shortages. Problems started just before Christmas and led to two straight weeks where a thousand or more flights were canceled every day. Quarters featuring poet Maya Angelou are now heading out across the country. The U.S. Mint is shipping the coins, the first in a series of 20 quarters that will be put into circulation honoring women and their achievements. 
Number one, Alabama had their throne stolen last night. Number three, Georgia took home the 2021 National College Football Championship. <laughs> Top stories we're following today, an apartment fire near the medical center rekindling overnight. The fire has impacted more than a dozen families at an apartment complex near Wurzbach Road in Gardendale. Fire officials say at least one person was taken to the hospital for smoke inhalation last night. Firefighters arrived again early this morning to find flames shooting through the roof. At least 20 people have impacted. No reports of major injuries. Another fire last night, this one claiming one life. Happened just before 10 last night at home on West Ridgewood Court on the northwest side, just west of I-10. So crews got there to find flames inside that house. When they walked in, they found an elder, elderly woman dead in a hallway. She has not yet been identified. So far, the cause of that fire is still unknown. And a man's in the hospital fighting for his life after an overnight shooting at an east side apartment complex. Happened just after midnight on Enoch Walk, just south of East Commerce. Police say the man confronted two people trying to steal his catalytic converter from his vehicle. That's when one of the suspects shot the victim in the chest and shoulder. He's now in critical condition. Police are still looking for those suspects. In your other morning headlines, we're hearing from the hero police officers who saved that pilot from getting killed by a train. And the pig's heart is keeping a man alive and neighbors uh, saving neighbors. David Sears is here to explain all of this this morning. Nice to see neighbors jump into action especially when it's little kids involved. So we'll have that for you in just a second. But first, this is that incredible video from Sunday. Body cam footage from LAPD. Two police officers dragging a bloody pilot out of a crash plane to safety seconds before a train just demolishes that plane. The pilot and owner, Mark Jenkins, took off from a nearby airport. He had malfunctions in his engine. The plane crashed on the Metro Railroad tracks. His family did not want to go on camera, but they did say that Jenkins actually put the plane down on the track so he could avoid houses and cars in the area. The officers called in to stop the train, but the message didn't get in time. So the officers jumped into action and saved Jenkins' life. At some point, we realized the train wasn't going to stop. But once we realized that a uh, train was coming at full speed down the tracks. Uh, we knew we had no choice. We had to find a way to get him out of there or else he was going to die. It was a scary moment, but everything worked out well. Jenkins, who is a retired Air Force pilot, suffered fractures to his face. He was scheduled for surgery yesterday. The next few weeks are going to be critical for a man in Maryland because 57-year-old David Bennett just went through a heart transplant, but he did not receive a human heart. Bennett is alive this morning with a pig's heart beating in his chest. It took surgeons nine hours to perform the transplant at the University of Maryland. The pig weighed in at 240 pounds. It was genetically modified for the purpose of the transplant. It was a last chance for Bennett to live since he was ineligible for a human heart. His family says he's aware that there is no guarantees, but he wanted to go through with it just for the chance to stay alive. For him, it provided a level of hope. My dad's only 57 years old, so that was that was very important to him, and he didn't feel like he was ready to die. He's awake. He is recovering and speaking to his caregivers, and um, we hope uh, that uh, the recovery that he is having now will continue. Absolutely incredible. The new procedures mark a major step in the decades-long quest to use animals as organ donors. By the way, there are more than 100,000 people here in the U.S. waiting for an organ transplant. And you are looking at a frozen pond in Colorado. It was a site of a near disaster. Three children were playing on the pond when the ice broke and they went in. A woman was actually in her kitchen looking out the window, saw it all, rushed to help. A teenage cousin of the kids also helped save their lives. All three pulled to safety. One child not breathing. EMTs were able to revive the six-year-old girl. She's hospitalized in serious condition, but expected to survive thanks to a quick thinking neighbor. I just kind of put some shoes on and ran out. I just knew that nobody, you know, nobody was really outside. So, I mean, I was gonna, it was me, you know? I just knew it was me that had to do it. Before I even realized that I was out there on the middle of the pond pulling two kids out. What she did, did was amazing. We were <laughs> back at the fire station talking about how brave she was, how great, great the officers did, and gosh, I hope if this happened to one of mine that some, somebody like her was close by. A little emotional there, wasn't he? But you think about it. Kids. She didn't yeah. hesitate. Yeah. I'm glad she was there watching.
Glad she so, didn't hesitate at all. Good for those kids. Yeah. It's like they just threw some shoes on and headed out onto the pond and didn't even yeah. think about, oh, uh, I could like end up in the pond. Right. Yeah, it almost looked like there were two spots where yeah. people either fell in or we're fell to, in, right. broke ice trying, trying to, to get, get them the out. That fell in. So, exactly. Yeah, dangerous, but you know, heroes. That's how we get our heroes, right? That's there. how we get them. Right. Thank you, David, mm -hmm. very much. The 68th annual Atascosa County Livestock Show kicked off this week, and some local students have been waiting for it. That's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some more than 60 students from Somerset ISD are participating at this year's event. Some showing off their skills raising animals, and others showing their design and construction of agricultural projects. Tiffany Huetas joins us live from the Atascosa County Livestock Show. Good morning, Tiffany. Uh, what are some of the skills students who are participating, what have they learned? Good morning, Stephanie and Mark. They're learning different skills, but they're learning leadership. They're learning teamwork and just how to compete in front of big crowds. And that's a lot of pressure, but they really do great. Just take a look. These are right behind me. Somerset High School students. They're getting ready for today's show. And we have Somerset agriculture teacher Justin Taylor and student Leo Strauss joining us. Good morning. Uh, talk to us, Leo. You had mentioned you have been doing this since fourth grade. Talk to us about how that's been. Well, it's just been an ongoing process, a lot of preparation involved. At the end of the day, you just, you're waiting to make the sale, whether you have a good pig or not, you just want your hard work to pay off at the end, and you just, a lot of patience, a lot of dedication involved in it, feeding, a lot of time and effort, and well, you just want your hard work to pay off, like anything else, really. Talk to us about the different shows that the students are going to be competing in. We see the pigs here, but there's other competition. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yesterday we competed in the cattle show. We had steers and heifers. Uh, today, actually going on in the ring right now, is the rabbit show. Um, they're getting the pigs checked in today. They'll have the ag mechanics going on. We have a whole list of different activities, all kinds of things going on here this week. When they compete in the pigs show, talk to us about what the judges are looking for. They're looking for a nice balance, uniformity, conformity, structural correctness, muscularity, and a real performance and growth. What are you looking forward to the most during the pig competition? Well, I'm just hoping to place, really, because usually I, I place, like, I just place good enough to make the sale. But usually what you look forward to place is just good structure in a pig, good base, make sure they walk good, make sure they, they don't look too fat, not too skinny, just make sure... It's good enough because, well, at the end of the day, that pig that your plate, you're showing right there is going to be on your plate someday. So you're going to, th that's going to be your, what you're going to eat one day. It's going to be on your store, so you're going to eat that pig eventually. And when we talk about the competition, you know, a lot of competitions and events have been getting canceled due to COVID surge. Talk to us about what makes this so different. Yes, um, it would through the diligence of not just our school, but of the county officials and stuff that we've had with our school and administration, we get tested every week. And that is what's good enough for us to make sure that we don't keep the spread going on of Omicron and the Delta and all of the, of the COVID that is happening. But for us, it, it's a guarantee that none of our kids are going to pass it on to anybody else. And we're just being very diligent. We have our hand wash stations. We have our, we do have some mask mandates. And, and if you're comfortable in wearing it, you wear it. And the biggest thing is that we try to take care of each other. And if you're feeling sick, by all means, don't come make sure you take care of it but the biggest deal is that our school has taken care of us by making sure that we're tested every week and that we know that we do not have it and we're not spreading it so that makes us makes it do it they're doing their part for us awesome well thank you so much for joining us this morning a lot of great work a lot of hard work back to you guys in the studio thank you tiffany right now 9 11 about 46 degrees still ahead on gmsa at nine while CPS is taking more of your money, customers are wondering why the utilities leaders can't spare some of their own, why business experts say it wouldn't fix the financial issues CPS is facing. Well, first, we're going to take you live to Burger Teca, where Max Massey has a preview of Culinaria Week. Culinaria's biannual restaurant week scheduled to kick off Saturday and run through January 29th. That means for two weeks, some of San Antonio's most popular food spots will offer brunch, lunch, and or dinner menus at a fixed price. Max Mancy is joining us live from Burger Teca. Max, what's cooking? Good morning, guys. It smells delicious out here. Take a look. We got three new burgers joined here with the chef, Johnny Hernandez. So, Chef Johnny, what are we looking at here? <laughs> All right. So, you know, Restaurant Week is always a, a, a time for us to get creative and think of some new menu items. So. We have our chicken chamoy, since chamoy kind of has exploded uh, in San Antonio. 
We now have our chicken chamoy burger. This is uh, a crispy onion barbecue that we made with a little bit of tamarind barbecue sauce, and then we have an avocado toast, right? <laughs> with a, we made it as kind of our vegetarian option. So this trio is what we're going to showcase during restaurant week, along with uh, fries a la mexicana. Ooh. So some, you know, some French fries with a little bit of crema, pico de gallo, and then a mangonada dessert ice cream. Because up here at Burger Teca, we have a nice array of paletas and ice creams that we spin Let's fresh. Oh, this, this is, is fantastic. Yes. Breakfast of champions, guys. <laughs> I got to say, though, Mark, Stephanie, we're not here just to eat and join Chef Johnny to talk about the culinary deliciousness going on. We're here to talk about Restaurant Week. So why is it so important for right. here at San Antonio? Well, Restaurant Week has been going on a long time now. Culinaria started it many years ago. And the reason it exists is to promote small business, local chefs, local restaurants, food trucks, and those, you know, those, you know, those brands or those concepts that are that are true to San Antonio, right? So it's always been a great promotional uh, week for us to, to showcase what we do, be creative, but also a uh, great value and give back to the organization. Culinary has, culinary has been around for many years, giving back to the food community. They were, they were, you know, during the pandemic, they were very supportive of a lot of the hospitality workers when we they were feeding the hospitality workers when we were you know we were really completely shut down but restaurant week has grown and i think the audience that participates in restaurant week the customers really look forward to it and i mean it's great because it promotes restaurants all over san antonio that are locally owned and that's really at the heart and soul of of the whole uh, initiative to promote small business promote restaurants on our end, we try to be more creative. We try to really come out with new and exciting things to bring those customers into our restaurants. And January is a great month to do it because it typically is a slower month for us. And uh, it's a, a great package deal, too, because uh, it's kind of a three-course offering at different price points. Lunch and dinner. You know, every restaurant's a little bit different, so you got to go online and check it out to see what appeals to you. But we will have tables that come in just for restaurant week that they have maybe had never been to let's say burger teca they never thought about it mm -hmm. but because it shows up in restaurant week they're here they, they say hey let's go try <laughs> that chamoy burger i'm excited <laughs> to try the chamoy burger so last question for you we know the recent spike in the omicron how has that affected you right. worker shortage etc well you know it's been very difficult a couple years as we know this last spike uh, could have probably come at a more challenging time which you know, after the holidays, there's a really a low in the business. So it is challenging to deal with. You know, it does kind of challenge us. In other words, where, you know, you can't necessarily focus just on the creative side. You've got to focus on the safety of your employees and the customer. And we're dedicated to that, you know, to, uh, to make sure that we don't miss a, a beat. And I think the industry, the restaurant industry as a whole, has been uh, on top of, of those important things that customers really look for in terms of safety. And uh, we continue to... Uh, to muscle through the pandemic. Uh, we're excited about Restaurant Week. Mm -hmm. You know, we thank Culinaria for, for really creating this initiative and growing it, growing it to where it really makes an impact. Right, it's fantastic. And so guys, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm so excited to dive into these burgers, <laughs> dive into the fries. If you have any questions about Culinary Restaurant Week, kicks off this Saturday. We have all those answers, just head to ksat.com. Steph, Mark? Yeah, Max, if you wanna bring that basket with all three of those new, uh, new burgers uh, back. You can share. Yeah, we will. We're okay with I, that. I do have a few extras, so who knows? Mm. I gotta treat Robert first. Oh, true, you do that first. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Max Massey live over at Burger Teca with Chef Johnny Hernandez, thank you very much. Yes, Chef. Oh, <laughs> Looking good. good. Thank Thank you. I know. It's like our lunch time right now, even though it's 920. What, is, what did you say during Max's live shot? They had you at Chamoy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like Chamoy Burger. Chicken I was chamoy. like, oh, Chamoy. That it just great. rolls right off the tongue, too. Chicken Chamoy. Looks good. It does. Sounds so good. It's so creative. Maybe he will bring something back. You better. Yeah. He better. We'll see. I'm not threatening him, but he better. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the rainfall, guys. It's been sort of an interesting morning where we're talking about these showers coming through. One, because we have had some reports of some sleet and grapple, some freezing precipitation, all of it light, none of it a threat to the roads or anything like that, but just sort of a gee whiz type thing. Uh, just because it's so cold up above that you get some of that, and even though temperatures are well above freezing at the ground, it does make it to the surface, albeit very, very light. We still see some of these showers that have been working through, and where you see some of these yellows and reds, that's where there's probably uh, some, I don't want to say heavier showers, but maybe more moderate showers. And then some very light stuff 
moving through, say, the Hondo area. We did get a report of some light rain there. It didn't accumulate to much, and that's really going to be the case for everybody today. It won't amount to much just because the air is so dry at the surface. Let's look a little bit closer here at San Antonio, and you can see that shower trying to work a little bit closer, kind of falling apart as it does. Can't rule out some light showers on the west side of Bear County. And then if you're north and west of Kerrville there along I-10, looks like we could see a little bit of rain. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, maybe a little bit of sleep mixed in there, again, north and west of Kerrville. But this is moving east and northeast. So we'll keep you posted. The, the, the chance for this light rain is going to be with us through the day, but you're mainly going to see cloud cover. We look at the future cast. We'll fast forward to 5 o'clock. Still shows some showers, but it's beginning to exit east now. And then tonight, we're left with just mostly cloudy skies. And then tomorrow, if you're hoping for some sun, you do get it tomorrow afternoon. Sun comes out, temperatures warm up. I mentioned the very dry air, and this is one of the reasons we're having problems with this precipitation actually reaching the ground. It evaporates because when you have dew points in the 20s, that air is very, very dry, and it just doesn't all make it down to the surface. We do need the rain, though. You look at the rainfall since no. November 1st, and we mentioned this yesterday, we've only had 2.33 inches at the airport. That's about 2.3 inches below average. So uh, some measurable rainfall would be nice. I just don't know that we'll get a lot today. Looking at the time lapse, you can see the clouds sort of moving in. We had some sun earlier right at, at sunrise, but now these clouds are starting to thicken up a little bit. 45 degrees at the airport, 41 Halotus, 43 Bernie Stage, 45 Canyon Lake, 47 in New Braunfels, 51 Catula, 46 in Creosote Springs, 50 in Del Rio, which again is, is very impressive that we did get a report of grapple there considering the air temperature at the surface here is at 50 degrees. Uh, rest of today, we'll get up to about 55 here in San Antonio. Rain chances uh, only at about 10%. Uh, the water vapor shows that little twist in the atmosphere. That's that disturbance that is rolling through. That moves east pretty quickly, but I want to look down the line a little bit. Thursday, Friday, beautiful. As we get into Saturday, here comes, well, this is Friday afternoon, but once so we get into Saturday morning, this front moves through, brings some very gusty winds. Unfortunately, no rain. This is still a dry pattern, even with these fronts coming through. And that'll be the case most of the week, and it'll be cooler. So here's how it looks in the seven-day forecast. 65 tomorrow, sun appears by tomorrow afternoon. 73 on Thursday, 73 Friday. Gusty winds on Saturday. Uh, temperatures falling into the 50s again. And then we'll rebound into the 60s back into next week, guys. Looks pretty good. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. 924, about 46 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9. Some tips for those of you trying to revamp your finances this year. Hi, welcome back. It's 927. If your New Year's resolution is to get your finances in top shape, one financial expert shares five money moves you should make right now to set yourselves up. Our producer, KSAT producer Dylan Collins, has this one. Happy New Year! New Year, new you. While many made New Year's resolutions to improve their health and wellness, financial experts say getting your finances in top shape should also be a priority this 2022. It's so important to focus on financial well-being, especially at the beginning of the year, because really you want to set yourself up for success. Personal finance coach Juliama Taveras recommends these five money moves. First, she says look back at last year and make a budget for this year. Decide how much you'll spend and save and figure out what needs to get cut. You want to pull out the things that you know maybe were just one-time things and also maybe some things that were recurring, like maybe ordering out too much or shopping a little bit too much that you could definitely cut back on. The second move is to start investing. Figure out what you'll set aside for your retirement and how much you can invest in other assets like real estate. The third move, jumpstart your career. Tavera says this may be the perfect time to seek new opportunities, like a new job that pays better. A lot of times when you move to a different company, you can oftentimes get up to 30% raise. And this past year, I've seen people get even 50% raise, which seems kind of crazy, but it is possible. And it's kind of the environment that we're in right now. Next, check your credit report. Look for potential errors and get them removed. Tavares also recommends requesting an interest rate decrease on your credit cards. And finally, eliminate debt. Create a debt payment plan so it doesn't feel overwhelming. Dylan Collins, KSAT 12 News. 
929 about 46 degrees. A lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. Forecasting change or Justin Horn takes a look at how methane gas is accelerating global warming and what technology is being used to combat it right here in San Antonio. But first, CPS Energy voted to take more of your money. So why can't they use some of their own? That story after the break. 932 CPS Energy's board just voted to take a little bit more of your money, about $5 or uh, about $5 more on average per month. But some customers are saying not so fast. Many of them were left in the dark during last February's winter storm despite paying their bills. So they're asking why utility leaders' salaries aren't on the chopping block instead. Patty Santos talks to a business expert who says that would be a sign of goodwill. This list outlines how much the 41 leaders at CPS Energy were making in April 2021. The lowest paid 155000 to the highest paid former CEO Paula Gold Williams, nearly half a million dollars annually. There's been a shakeup within the utilities since then. In an interview with Councilman Clayton Perry, CPS Energy Interim President and CEO Rudy Garza says the 3.85% rate increase will not pay for executives or directors, but will benefit employees. We've got to remain competitive, so how we structure our compensation has to look at who we're competing with. He's referring to linemen, gas technicians, engineers, and those in the front line that help keep energy flowing. The Bose rate increase expected to generate about $73 million. Funds set to be needed to support infrastructure and technology upgrades. There's also the cyber risk that can happen any day of the week that we also have to protect ourselves against. And a lot of this, uh, these dollars are going towards you know technology that will help us stay ahead of, of those bad actors. And to keep up with the company's growth and a $418 million bill in fuel costs from February's winter storm over the next 25 years. CPS is going through a lot of changes right now uh, that in, in terms of leadership and, and in terms of uh, their leadership team. And I think we're all a little bit nervous about what the grid is going to look like uh, for this next spring. Customers wonder why CPS Energy isn't cutting off salaries and bonuses for those in the leadership of the company. St. Mary's University professor Cody Cox says it would be a sign of solidarity but wouldn't fix the budget problems. Oftentimes CEOs are paid through stock options and the worth of the organization. So they, and so when they're, there's no way to, to cut that exactly to, to fix a budget deficit. He says some experts would agree it's time to adopt a more fair compensation strategy for leaders of major companies. It's something that a lot of researchers would argue is a problem that CEO salaries are so large compared to, I, I should say compensation is so much greater than employees. And so it can lead to CEOs being motivated for short-term benefits. Case that reached out to CPS Energy to see if any top leaders expect to cut their pay, but we have not heard back. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. And taking a look outside with live cam, beautiful shot out there with live cam. We're at 46 degrees and we're expected to kind of stay a little chilly. Today. Yeah, we're not going to see a big warm-up stuff because you saw the cloud cover there on live cam. Clouds have moved in. We're also watching a few Light showers work their way through the area this morning and surprisingly a little bit of wintry precip. But with that being said, it's, it's very light. It's not causing any problems. It's just more of a gee whiz thing. We did get a couple reports of some sleet or grapple, but most of this you're seeing here is light rain. And I mean light because it's so dry at the surface. Some of this isn't even hitting the ground at the moment, though. We are watching some showers work their way into San Antonio very light stuff that's working in towards the western half of the county. So don't be surprised if there's a few drops on your windshield if you're heading out right now. I don't know that you'll need an umbrella all day long, but you may grab it just in case if uh, if you do get caught underneath one of these very light showers. Uh, up around Kerrville, Fredericksburg, seeing the same thing. Looks fairly heavy, but most of this is uh, really pretty light as a disturbance works through the area. Temperatures on the cool side, 45 degrees at the airport, 43 burning stage, 40 comfort, 42 in Bandera. You see all the clouds moving in, so we'll see quite a bit of cloud cover today. I uh, didn't mean to mention this earlier. Mount Cedar dropped today. Moderate, 460. That's a good sign. Molds are low at 380, so both of them drop. Forecast takes us up to 55 this afternoon. Just some small chances of showers there in the forecast. Northeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Guys. Thank you very much, Justin. Right now, still got this accident working access road out there at I-35 at Ritterman. We don't have any information for you, but I can tell you this. Uh, Stephen Cavazos is out there trying to get more information, and we're anticipating to hear from the uh, San Antonio Police Department here uh, very short. We'll let you know more as soon as we get it.
Transfers are headed back home after a tough road trip ends with a loss to the Knicks. And we have a new college football champion after a thriller between Bama and Georgia last night. David and RJ are here to break it all down. Good morning, gentlemen. Stayed morning. Up. Stayed up and watched both of those. You did? Wow, okay. It's nap time. <laughs> telling you that right I'm now. Like, I, I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm hurting a little bit this morning, but it's because of the college football game, not yeah. so much the Spurs. Well, that one RJ. Kind of got <laughs> the, the Spurs are hurting this morning. So, They've been all right, they were in New York wrapping up this seven-game road trip. This is seven games in yeah. 11 nights, and by the time we got to the third oh, quarter, yeah. they looked tired. They looked like, okay, well, it's time to go home. Yeah. Let's cut this out. It was like 68-65. Mm -hmm. Midway through the third, about five and a half minutes left in the third, and then the Knicks just kind of blew them out from there. So uh, Yeah, remember, yeah. They're, they're missing a lot of guys, a lot yeah. of guys on the COVID, the health and safety protocols hung in there, but in the fourth quarter, uh, New York kind of blew this one open with an 18-2 run pretty early on, and then Pop just decided, uh, you know what, let's just, uh, let's just call it a road trip and head back home because they have 10 of their next 12 games, David, here at the AT&T Center. So tough road trip, but uh, hopefully come back home for some, some home cooking here. You know, if DeJounte Murray is an example of what guys can do coming back from the COVID protocols, then hopefully they'll get Devin Vassell and Derek White and all those other guys back, and they'll play like DeJounte. I mean, last night he had 24. He had four rebounds. He had five assists. He was 11 to 19. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty good for a guy who was, you know, out of, out of action for yeah, what, and he, like five, six games. Yeah, like he that. definitely needs some help. Some Another uh, yeah. sort of positive sign here is that Josh Primo got a lot of playing time. I don't know what the Spurs had planned on that. But uh, Josh Primo had another nice game yesterday. He's had like double digits in the past three games, really having to step up. Now, Pop did say, David, that uh, Primo's going to be going back to Austin once the other guys come back. So it was That's fun. right. He we needs some playing some, time. Yeah. He said, I think yeah. Pop said he needs to, needs to develop some mm -hmm. good habits. Some positive habits. He needs some playing time. So that's all right. Because, you know, the way things are going these days, he'll be back. So, and the Spurs will be back in action. Uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, Wednesday. Ooh. Yeah, tomorrow yeah, night, 7.30. Yep. The Rockets, they got the Rockets, they've got the Cleveland, and they've got L.A. three in a row at home before they go back out on the road. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. so uh, a lot of home games coming up. Hopefully, uh, we get the fans out there to support these guys because, again, they were, they're playing hard. Uh, unfortunately, a little undermanned right now, and hopefully yep. we get some of these other guys back, Derek White as well. Let's get him healthy for the rodeo road trip. How about that? There you go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the logo of your uh -oh. national champion, <laughs> George Bulldog. Ugga. Ugga. Ugga was all over the place. This game last night was like, uh, I don't want to call it. If you like defense, this was a great defensive game in the first half. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all it was, was defense in the first half. But they finally uh, – It felt, David, to me like a heavyweight fight. Like yeah. both fighters kind of just feeling each other out early on, you know, kind of seeing where each other was at. And uh, we knew some big plays were coming too. down in the end. George is pulling away here at the uh, in the fourth quarter late as the uh, dogs finally beat Bama, David. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> what, there was uh, no touchdowns in the first half. There's like four touchdowns in, in the second half, one in the third by Georgia, and then two more in the uh, fourth by Georgia. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, oh, last that's play of the game for yeah. Alabama Crimson Tide. They lost a receiver in the championship game and then they, in the SEC championship yeah. game. And then they lost another one last night. So that didn't help them out much. But Georgia was just – their their offensive decent Ooh. lines just started taking over. They just yeah. started dominating because yeah. they were not going to let Alabama beat them again. No, and even – I mean, we don't have the video of the quarterback, uh, Stetson Bennett. He was crying on the yeah. sidelines he, at he the end of that I game. Mean, he was shedding tears. He was tears crying. Here. I mean, this was a big win for Georgia. They had not won a national championship in 40 years. And, of course, they just could not beat Alabama for the past five or but, six years. But that kid was under – so much pressure mm -hmm. and he yeah. he looked like it at the start of the game Ooh. I mean he was just running down the field with the ball and just dropped it <laughs> luckily it came right back to him but I mean you could tell that he was yeah. feeling the pressure and finally he relaxed and started throwing some some really good passes and uh, so congratulations to the Georgia Bulldogs mm -hmm. I think uh, Alabama's already picked a win next year they are they're they already are. like number one in the way early 25 yeah. so is A&M uh, Justin wow. so that's so, good so enjoy it, Georgia while you can it didn't last long but we're yeah. on the yeah. next Nick year, Saban right? will be okay yeah. Right. Yeah. congrats for now All right. All right. So there you go RJ David, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Time now, 941 and 46 degrees for now. Well, Justin Horn explains how local researchers are combating global warming by patching methane leaks. Carbon dioxide has long been a target when it comes to cleaning up emissions and fighting climate change. But in the last few years, you've probably heard quite a bit about methane's role, too. In fact, it's a more powerful greenhouse gas, so detecting methane emissions has become increasingly important. And as Justin Horn tells us, efficient ways to do just that are being developed right here in San Antonio. 
The global reduction of CH4, commonly known as methane, has been kicked into high gear. When we think of um, greenhouse gases, oftentimes we think of only carbon dioxide, or that's maybe the most commonly reported. Um, methane is actually a much more powerful greenhouse gas. In fact, it traps more than 80 times as much heat as carbon dioxide. So where do you most often find this greenhouse gas? You have agricultural, so for example, manure management. You have landfills, and then you have oil and gas. In the first two cases, it's a byproduct. But when it comes to what is delivered to consumers... Methane makes up about 90 to 95% of the natural gas that would come into your home. And when that gas leaks from the system, instead of being burned at the end point, that creates a greenhouse gas effect. And those leaks? Well, they happen more often than you think. Just in the United States, there are about 2.6 million miles of gas pipeline. So that's everything from transmission lines to the distribution lines that come to your home. There's a lot more opportunity for leaks to occur. This flange or elbow connection or any connections here along this pipeline are places where methane could leak out and you would never know it. It's not visible to the naked eye and it's odorless. When you're losing somewhere on the order of about 5% of the gas, it is actually contributes more to climate change than coal burning. To add to it, there's intentional venting of methane by gas companies. All of it monitored by the Environmental Protection Agency. But that's not an easy job, and that's where Heath Spidell and his team at Southwest Research Institute here in San Antonio come in. A research engineer, he has helped develop cameras which operate off the infrared spectrum. So when you use this camera, um, what you're doing is you actually um, are trying to see the methane that is um, you can't see with the human eye. The methane appears as a red mask. It's technology that can also be attached to a drone. You can fly around your site, so you can get these inspections done much quicker. And with the machine learning aspect of it, you can flag every component that you see when you're in the air. Marking a huge step forward in cost effectiveness and efficiency, and hopefully reducing the harmful effects of this greenhouse gas. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. Justin, that kind of thermal detection has become more widespread in the industry, or are they just now kind of rolling out that kind of tech? It, it's becoming more widespread. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of been around, but they're, they're making it better and mm -hmm. they're making it more efficient. And they've found ways to do this and make it cost effective. And really, that's sort of the end game, right? Once you can do this uh, pretty easily, then we can detect these leaks and uh, we can get rid of that greenhouse gas. I guess the cool thing is that tech is being fine-tuned right here in San Antonio. Yeah, Southwest Research yeah. Institute is amazing. I mean, they do, they do really great work there, so it's just incredible, and we, we thank them for uh, help with this story. So uh, interesting stuff, nonetheless, guys. And thank you, Justin. Yeah, and we're, we're going to jump to the forecast here. Speaking of uh, forecasting change, let's talk about these uh, showers that are working through the Hill Country right now. We see that on live radar. These are working off to the uh, east, and we've seen some places where uh, we have gotten some light showers this morning around Hondo. We saw a couple showers a little bit earlier, and uh, we did see some showers up around Kerrville. I'm going to go ahead and put this uh, radar into motion. Looks like it's not moving, but you get the general idea here is that uh, we do have uh, light showers around, and we'll continue to sh see some of that activity into the noon hour. Even here around San Antonio, you'll notice we've got a little shower trying to work into town here. Some light stuff, but uh, don't be surprised if you see a few sprinkles or some white rain on the city's west side there around Alamo Ranch uh, if this shower does indeed hold together. It's mostly just some sprinkles just because the air is so dry at the surface, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. A little closer look around the Kerrville area, seeing some showers working towards Fredericksburg. Kerrville seen a few showers, Medina, Bandera as well. And I looks worse than it is. Okay, a lot of that looks like it's heavy, but it's really not. And you look at the future cast, we'll continue to see, see some of these showers through about 5 o'clock, and then that'll move east. We're left with just some clouds tonight. And then as uh, we get into tomorrow morning, still cloudy, but by the afternoon, the sun pops out. So if you're looking for some sun, you will get it tomorrow. It does get warmer, too. And there's the scene outside. We've got uh, cloudy skies now. 45 degrees at the airport, 50 stints in 46 Kelly, 46 in Randolph. And with all these clouds in place, we're just not going to get a big warm up today. You see the, uh, the the clouds moving in from the west, and this is mostly high level moisture, but it's thick enough uh, to uh, take away the sun. And right now, temperatures 41 Kerrville, 37 Junction, 43 in Uvalde. And I should mention, we talked a little bit about this earlier. There were some reports of some light sleet and grapple mixed in uh, across the hill country. Temperature is just cold enough, even though it's it's above freezing at the surface to see a little bit of that, but it would cause no issues whatsoever.
just kind of a, a cool thing to see. And we saw a couple pictures on social media. Dew points are very, very low in the 20s, and that's why a lot of this precipitation is not reaching the ground. It gets evaporated before it does. Rest of today, temperatures make it up to about 55. That's it. We'll keep it fairly cloudy. And on water vapor, you can see a little twist in the atmosphere. It's moving to our north, so that's where the bulk of the action will be uh, today as we look at the forecast. So that's good East by tomorrow. The sun's back out Thursday, Friday, same story. We get those temperatures back into the 70s. It'll be a nice end to the work week. But by the weekend, here comes our next front. Comes through without any rain, which is unfortunate. Turns windy, gusty winds, very dry air, and lack of rainfall. I think we do have to become a little concerned on Saturday with some uh, fire issues. I don't know if that'll be widespread, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. The longer we go without rain, and once we get some of these wind events, it's just something to remember. 65 degrees tomorrow, 73 Thursday, 73 Friday. Gusty winds on Saturday, turning cooler, 59, and then back into the 60s by next week. We'll be right back. Make sure to join us tomorrow. We have a packed show planned, including Katie's Science Lab, which is back for 2022. Katie and David are starting things off with a bang this year. They will be live at Veramende Elementary visiting Mrs. Hamilton's fifth grade class. Their experiment is a secret. Find out what they're doing tomorrow on GMSA at 9. A quick look out at the roads with Transguide. Again, we are waiting for an update from Stephen Cavazos. He is out there at I-35 and Ritterman Road. Where an 18-wheeler's trailer was clipped by a train. He tells us nobody was hurt, but the road will be closed for roughly two hours as the investigation wraps up. We'll bring you out the updates coming up on the news at noon. All right, have you heard of Wordle yet? Apparently I, taking the internet by storm. Yeah, I hadn't until today, to be honest with you. And you hadn't either. No, this is yeah. my first time. All right, so it's a little puzzle online. Uh, it's a new daily word game that ha has word nerds all over the world obsessed with trying to guess a five-letter word. Yeah, so you get uh, six attempts at guessing the word, and uh, it says if it's the incorrect letters turn up gray, and then the correct letters show up as yellow. So then it kind of becomes like a word game, like Wheel of Fortune. So by process of elimination, use your noggin. Your goal is to guess the word in as few attempts as possible. The game is so simple, but when you're just throwing five-letter words out there and hoping you can get a match, it can be extremely difficult to come up with educated guesses. So there is a catch. You can only play it what one time a day. You One time a day, yeah. but six chances, and there's no app or anything. You just go to Wordle on a web, uh, their website, Wordle's website. I think it's Wordle.com, but I, I got it on the first try yeah, today. Yeah, Mark told me he got it on the first try, which is pretty cool. And so you're uh, just playing for bragging rights? Is that Yeah, the, I yeah. think so, because a lot of people post it afterwards. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, yeah, so the number of people who play it has gone from 90 to 300,000 as of Sunday. All wow. right, so Google it, look for Wordle, and that's the word on this Tuesday, the 11th.